Louisiana, a land rich in history and resources, originally the home of the Natchez, the Homa, and the Choctaw, but the adopted home of Iberville, Bienville, and Tonti. Louisiana, the focus of international struggle and intrigue for centuries, a place of mystique, the home of a people known for distinct culture and institutions, the parish, the police jury. Louisiana, that catalyst for transforming the former British North American colonists into a national melting pot. Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, the refinement of blues and the gospel, the source of Creole and Cajun food, the home of Huey Long and Evangeline, Lee Armstrong and Marie Laveau. The Louisiana Purchase, arguably the world's most significant real estate transaction, will be the subject of this semester-long series, both on its immediate importance and its continuing impact today. Welcome to the fourth lecture in our continuing series on Louisiana Purchase. This week's lecturer is Research Professor of History Dr. Ida Altman. Dr. Altman has published extensively on Latin American and Mexican history. It is within that context that she places Louisiana as a Spanish colony from 1765 to 1803. The lecture will focus on economic growth, demographic change in politics, and society in Louisiana under Spanish rule, and the integration of Louisiana into the Spanish Empire in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Professor Altman will provide insights into the large role Spain played and transform Louisiana from a distant French backwater province into a thriving entity on the verge of an economic and population explosion by the time Spain departed Louisiana in 1803. In 1783, a young black man who was living in New Orleans, Santiago de Rome, or James Durham, paid 500 pesos to purchase his freedom from his master, a Scottish doctor who was named Roberto Dow. Born in Philadelphia, de Rome had acquired his knowledge of medicine from a former master, Dr. John Kearsley, who was a specialist in throat disorders. Within five years of gaining his freedom, de Rome had become a respected medical practitioner living in New Orleans. Fluent in English, French, and Spanish, he attracted a large clientele from nearly all the city's diverse national and ethnic groups. Jerome's career suggests some distinctive and seemingly paradoxical aspects of Spanish rule in society in late 18th century Louisiana. Like so many other residents of New Orleans, whether they were of European, African, or Native American background, Jerome was an immigrant who, like others, found notable opportunities for upward social, economic, and in his case, professional mobility. Spanish laws that regulated slavery were more liberal than those of the French, British, or the United States. They had provided the legal means for him to purchase his freedom, while the expanding economy and population of late 18th century New Orleans helped Durham to establish himself as a distinguished physician notwithstanding his racial background and former slave status. Thank you. 
emphasis on the French legacy to some extent has obscured the many other elements that combine to produce the prosperous and diverse society and culture that would take hold in Louisiana in the 19th century. This raises several related questions. Was Spanish Louisiana really Spanish? Given that in the 18th century, Spain was increasingly associated with royal absolutism, how did a Spanish regime in Louisiana foster socioeconomic fluidity and help to provide unanticipated economic opportunities, not only for the Spaniards who came there, but for black, Acadian, French, Anglo, and German settlers as well. And if the Spanish period in Louisiana was important to its history, why is it so little remembered or understood today? This is not to suggest, however, that military concerns were unimportant. As Spain acquired Louisiana and began to settle Upper or Alta California, the Spanish Empire in the Americas reached its greatest extent at a time when Spanish naval and military power and commercial clout were far overshadowed by those of Britain. Spain faced serious challenges to its hegemony in the Americas and control over its vast empire from the British and Russians in California and the British and French in the Gulf Coast and Caribbean. In response, Spanish authorities in New Spain implemented a series of jurisdictional changes in the Northern Territories intended to place the entire huge area on a military footing. Although nominally falling within the Viceroyalty of New Spain, Louisiana in fact was governed mainly from Havana and so never was incorporated into this newly created militarized zone of northern New Spain. <laughs> 
Still, military considerations certainly affected Spanish activity in Louisiana. Hundreds of soldiers were sent there, and local militias were organized as well. Attempts were made to fortify New Orleans itself with the construction of a stockade and forts. During his successful campaign against the British during the American Revolution that resulted in the conquest of West Florida, Louisiana Governor Bernardo de Galvez led troops that included local militia units, largely staffed by free men of color, as well as regular troops. 
In Louisiana, the territory of which extended well up the Mississippi River to St. Louis, Spanish officials quickly realized that their traditional approaches to dealing with local Indian groups were unlikely to succeed. Many of the groups that lived in the area had already formed strong alliances with the French. To the east were groups in contact with the British, who were able to supply large quantities of desirable trade goods, including alcohol and arms, which traditionally Spaniards refused to provide for their Indian subjects, allies, or trading partners. Indian groups, for their part, were reluctant to transfer their allegiance to a new ruling power that failed to furnish them with the kind of goods they desired and threatened to upset existing patterns of alliance and trade. As a result, Spaniards in Louisiana were forced to adopt policies toward Indians that were quite similar to those that had been developed by the British and French. The practical realities of Louisiana's geopolitical situation fostered other unanticipated accommodations. As was true for other sparsely populated parts of the empire, the Spanish crown was convinced that it was necessary to populate territory in order to secure it against external challenges. Ideally, of course, new settlers would have been Spaniards, and in fact, immigrants from the Canary Islands and elsewhere in Spain did come to Louisiana. Sponsoring this kind of colonization, however, proved prohibitively expensive, and in many ways, these settlement efforts fell short of expectations, although the Canary Islanders, whose descendants are today known as the Isleños, did establish a continuing presence in the colony. If sufficient numbers of Spaniards could not be brought or enticed to Louisiana, officials determined that any kind of Catholics would be acceptable. Hence, Spanish Louisiana welcomed the Acadians, who had been expelled from Nova Scotia after the British conquest of Canada, as well as French immigrants from France and later from Saint-Domingue. Immigration policy was further liberalized over the course of Spanish rule, as Anglos and Anglo-Americans also were permitted to settle, initially in the expectation that they would convert to Catholicism and eventually assimilate into Spanish and Catholic society. It soon became obvious that this hope was unlikely to be fulfilled vis-a-vis -vis the non-Spanish and non-Catholic residents of their territory, Spanish officials came to embrace a policy of religious laissez-faire, as long as the practice of Protestantism remained strictly a private matter. In the end, a certain accommodation was made between the two approaches, although formally the laws and institutions of Spain prevailed. Perhaps surprisingly, they afforded new opportunities to many of the colony's residents, especially here in New Orleans, as some of them proved to be more progressive than the French institutions they had supplanted. A Spanish city council, the Cabildo, replaced the old French Superior Council. I'm standing here today in the old City Hall building on Jackson Square, which now is known as the Cabildo and is part of the Louisiana State Museum. The City Council not only gave prominent individuals, most of whom were French planters and merchants, a greater say in local affairs, but for the first time it provided New Orleans with a fully functional city government that would undertake public works and concern itself actively with issues related to the public welfare, as was traditional in Spanish municipalities.
the City Council concerned itself with the construction and maintenance of levees, streets, bridges, and drainage ditches, as well as the regulation of the marketplace. Under Governor Carondelet, for example, significant improvements were made in street lighting, flood control, and the maintenance of a police, police force. New Orleans acquired its first public market, rebuilt after it was destroyed in the 1788 fire. The Spanish introduced firefighting equipment and not night watchmen, called serenos, to patrol the streets. The Cabildo also attempted to regulate the supply, price, and quality of flour, bread, and meat, which was standard practice in the Spanish world. According to Gilbert Din, currently the foremost historian of Spanish Louisiana, and I quote, urban government in Louisiana properly began with the Spaniards. Regarding the thorny issue of trade, the Spanish regime in Louisiana again was forced into progressively greater flexibility and openness. In 1768, trade between Louisiana and nine Spanish ports was officially endorsed, which was in keeping with a newly adopted Bourbon policy of so-called free trade, which was intended to liberalize trade within the Spanish Empire itself in face of growing demand and the obsolescence of the old fleet system. In 1782, direct trade between New Orleans and Pensacola with France was permitted, and American ships were increasingly successful in obtaining special licenses to trade. Initially, Spain attempted to limit commercial traffic in the lower Mississippi to Spanish ships, but with contraband, subterfuge, and the dispensing of special licenses the ban was never very successful. New Orleans, in any case, was increasingly dependent on imports of American staples that were produced upriver. In 1788, Americans gained access to the Mississippi in exchange for payment of a 15 percent duty. And the 1795 Treaty of San Lorenzo granted U.S. citizens the right to navigate the Mississippi and ship their goods from New Orleans.
Well, clearly, in the matter of trade, Spaniards were forced to make a series of concessions to French and American interests. These compromises by no means were unique to Louisiana, nor did they arise solely out of internal pressures within the colony. This was an age of great conflicts that caused major disruptions in transatlantic trade, and Spain was forced to make similar concessions in other parts of the empire in order to keep Spanish-American ports supplied with needed goods. The neutrality and expanding productivity in markets of the United States made it the obvious choice to fill the supply gap. Trade between the U.S. and Mexico, for example, increased in this era as well. The difference in the case of Louisiana, of course, lay in its proximity to the United States, coupled with the increasing numbers of Americans who had entered Louisiana territory to settle there, especially in the area around Natchez. These developments had significant implications for Louisiana's future. The proximity of the United States with its rapidly developing economy as well as continuing ties with France and new connections to the Spanish ports of the Gulf and Caribbean, Havana, Veracruz and Tampico certainly had a substantial impact on Louisiana's economy which embarked on a course of rapid commercialization. Although this process would not reach fruition until the American era, certainly it got underway under the Spanish. By the 1780s, Louisiana was exporting substantial amounts of indigo and tobacco, the latter destined mainly for Spain and Mexico, as well as furs, which mainly were sent to France and elsewhere in Europe. Overproduction of tobacco to supply tobacco factories in Spain and Mexico eventually proved disastrous, especially for planters of the Natchitoches and Red River District and the industry collapsed. The decline of indigo production signaled or coincided with the beginnings of the rise of sugar and later cotton to primacy, developments that really belong to the 19th century. In addition to the expansion of trade between Louisiana and the United States, Britain, Spain, France, Mexico, and Cuba, Industry also began to develop in Louisiana with the appearance of sawmills, distilleries, cotton mills, and sugar refineries. <music> 
Although the theater attracted enthusiastic audiences, by far the most popular form of entertainment for nearly all groups was dancing. Slaves danced in the Plaza de Arbas, present-day Jackson Square, on holidays, and dances were held at public ballrooms on a regular basis. People also danced in taverns, billiard halls, and in private homes. In principle, separate venues hosted balls for whites and free blacks, but there's little doubt that whites, free blacks, and even slaves all socialized at both public and private dances, despite official attempts to segregate these events according to race and status. In 1805, shortly after the United States acquired Louisiana, New Orleans boasted 15 public ballrooms. A ball could attract as many as 500 people. Nestor's first major philanthropic project was the construction of the Lepers Hospital. In 1782, he offered to rebuild Charity Hospital, which had been nearly destroyed by the hurricanes of 1779 and 1780. The new hospital, built entirely of brick and including a church, sacristy and chapel, four wards and a pharmacy, was completed in 1786. Almonester was officially designated the hospital's patron by the King of Spain in 1793. Undoubtedly, his most famous and historically significant project was the construction of the Cathedral, Presbyter, and City Hall, which today is known as the Cabildo and is part of the Louisiana State Museum, on the Plaza de Armas, which replaced buildings that had burned in 1788. For his greatest building project, he employed the services of the architect Gilbert Guillemard, a native of France who had pursued a military career in the service of Spain. Guillemard also had important connections through marriage to two of Spanish Louisiana's governors. The new church designed by Guillemard, soon to become St. Louis Cathedral, escaped the 1794 fire. Amonesta also promised to rebuild the city hall following the same plan as for the Presbyter, also designed by Guillemard. 
attempts to label late 18th century Louisiana as one thing or another are likely to fail. Spain acquired French Louisiana at a time that Spain itself was experiencing a great deal of French influence in architecture and fashion as well as intellectual and political life, particularly in the upper echelons of society and court circles. In Spanish Louisiana, especially in the higher ranks of society, intermarriage and social and business relationships all reflected considerable intermingling of Spanish bureaucrats, military officers, and entrepreneurs with French merchant and planter families. French residents of Louisiana learned Spanish and hispanized their names. Men who aspired to military careers quickly realized that their advancement depended on being able to speak and write Spanish. The appearance of a Spanish language newspaper, El Mississippi, in 1808 certainly attests to the existence of a substantial Spanish-speaking population in Louisiana by the end of the Spanish era. At another level, however, the presence and interaction of peoples of varying races, nationalities, and languages further complicates the effort to categorize the society that emerged in late 18th century Louisiana. In the more rural and sparsely populated parts of the province, there still existed enclaves of Acadian, German, American, Spanish, and French settlement of varying size. At the same time, in New Orleans especially, the growing presence and influence of free and enslaved people of African descent and the still discernible, if diminished, presence of local Indians tempered the formation of a predominantly European society. Can we then discern a genuinely Spanish legacy in Louisiana? Arguably, the consolidation of the Catholic Church, which has held its own in southern Louisiana to the present day, owed much to the efforts of Spanish officials and ecclesiastics who brought in more priests and established new parishes. Streets in the French Quarter, Bourbon, Barracks, Royal, and the names of Louisiana's present-day parishes and towns, East and West Feliciana, Ascension, St. Bernard, St. Charles, New Iberia, also reflect their Spanish origins. The ties that New Orleans formed with other parts of the Spanish Empire, Havana, Veracruz, Tampico, and Yucatan considerably outlasted Louisiana's incorporation into the United States and Mexico's achievement of independence from Spain. 19th century New Orleans welcomed both Spanish refugees from independent Mexico and Mexican diplomats and businessmen. Spain's liberal immigration and settlement policies helped to fuel a nearly five-fold growth in population to some 50,000 residents by the end of the Spanish regime. And the combination of liberal trade policies and new commercial opportunities further stimulated Louisiana's economic development. Spain's relatively liberal laws regulating slavery led to the expansion of the free colored group in New Orleans especially. Spain's brief period of rule in Louisiana then not only contributed considerably to the colony's growth in size, prosperity, and diversity in the late 18th century, but also fostered developments that would endure in Louisiana to the present. To learn more about the Louisiana Purchase and the rich history of Louisiana, visit the Louisiana State Museum's Cabildo, located on historic Jackson Square in the heart of
of the New Orleans French Quarter. <laughs>